and today we'll talk about a fight, al qital. This is part eight. The Arabic term qital consists of four radical Q T A L. It is derived from the four radical verb qatala, which belongs to the same verb form fa'ala. Fa'ala, as verbs such as jadala to contest, khasama to quarrel, sharaka to share, and baya to make a contract. The long a is in qital. Uh, is as with the long a in jihad not accidental as some have claimed but rather essential to the word meaning to ignore the long a in qital has seriously has serious implications and would create even more harm than if it was neglected in the word al-jihad this is because we took Qatala as a synonym for Qatala, the first word, the first verb form without a long A. The meaning of to fight, Qatala, would turn into to kill, Qatala, which as we will explain in this section would be a serious misunderstanding of the term. Together with, with, uh, with its many verbal uh, cognates, the, the noun Qatal occurs 71 times in the book it connotes a violent clash between two opposing sides either two individuals or two groups of people <clears throat> if only one side seeks to fight while the other refuses to fight the resulting collision cannot be called qital as we read in the following verse should you stretch your hand out to kill me i will not stretch i will not stretch my hand out to kill you laqtulaka for i fear allah lord of the words the worlds maida 528 this implies that if one side does not commit itself to a fight and withdraw and withdraws while the other side keeps fighting it becomes a one-sided battle a fight is also one-sided if it is initiated by one side the aggressor while its opponents is not given a chance to respond this this is the case with suicide missions in Iraq and elsewhere, which innocent defenseless, defenseless people are attacked by unknown arm, uh, armed aggressors. Such missions are premeditated collective killing in a one-sided fight because they are planned deliberately to give the ambushed victims no chance to either defend themselves or to fight back. The best description of qital can be found in the following verse. Fighting is prescribed for you. Kutubah wa huwa kurhan lakum. Al-Baqarah, verse 216. This verse states that the obligation to fight is one of the hardest duties to fulfill. The phrase, and you dislike it, mean that a human soul will find it naturally very distressing to fight and kill anyone. To fight, therefore, must be seen as a last resort when all other means to solve a conflict have been exhausted. And yet to fight has been prescribed as a duty by Allah. Similar to his orders to fast and to exact retribution, it is a religious obligation that, like any other obligation, only the rational and sane person may fulfill. Some executives have claimed that it is an individual duty to which everyone must comply. Others have claimed that it, it was only a duty for the Prophet and his companions and is therefore not applicable any longer. The latter view is driven by fear, by the fear of admitting that Islam prescribes fighting as a religious duty. The truth is that to fight has been glossed as jihad and to fight in God's way has become mixed up with the notion of military conquest. The first error occurred when to fight al-qital was defined as the essence of the ill-named smaller jihad as it was incorrectly called translated from the prophet because of the many variations and the time from the actual event that happened, how it happened, and by the time they recorded, 
it was misunderstood or mis uh, it was it was translated it was uh, trans translated by meaning not actually by word not necessarily by word but by the meaning so that's why it was called ilfated because we don't know the exact words for it but we could try to derive it from what the Quran and what he meant and said by it the second more dangerous mistake was made when smaller jihad was given an exclusively military connotation to fight qatal to fight qatal turned into kill qatl, which was then associated with the military battles for the expansion of the islamic empire once again this terminological confusion was caused by the executive's failure to distinguish between the verses of the messengerhood and the prophethood in the book, the executives ignored the fact that the stories of Muhammad's military expeditions belong to the verses of prophethood and do not possess le legislative authority. It will be necessary, therefore, to first point out the difference between jihad and to fight, qital. In the previous section, we learned that jihad compromised many activities that are not in any way militant such as the duty to seek knowledge wherever you are, to provide maintenance and sustenance for your family, to suffer the pain of menstru menstruation, to provide guardianship for a woman, to resist the temptation of your carnal soul, to be steadfast in the face of great challenges, and so forth. None of these things involve throwing stones or firing rocket grenades. They can be achieved without resorting to physical violence and are indeed the opposite of armed conflicts. This is, this, in, this is in sharp contrast to fight in the sense of qatal, which by definition implies the use of violence to resolve a conflict when all other means have failed. Examples of such fights are given by the book. Both fights between individuals and battles between large armies example the battles of badr ahud khaybar and at taif all these fights are reported as historic historic events like the stories about moses and noah and are thus just quranic stories which do not belong to the verses of messengerhood this makes it possible to regard allah's order to fight as an individual duty that is valid at all times and places fighting is prescribed for you and you dislike it two uh chapter two verse 216 this is different from the so-called sword verse then fight and slay the pagans wherever you find them because the command to fight here is historically qualified Whereas the former verse contained an, an order to fight that was universally, yeah, uni has universal validity. The latter verse given an order that is applicable only in a very special historical context that should not be universally applied. It's part of a story that happened that time. And it was an answer to a previous verse in Surah Muhammad that we will look it up and you see it was an answer to a question. And it was just for that one time. It is astonishingly, it is astonishing to see how consistently the Fuqaha have inflicted a military intention on the book book's vocabulary, dogmatically using the notion of synonymity. The, they equated al fath opening with the harb war, jihad with fight, and fight with raiding Ghazwa. Their ill-conceived theory of abrogation meant that later Medinan verses such as Atoba 5 were thought to repeal earlier Med Meccan verses as a, as a consequence of which the sword replaced peaceful persuasion and the believers fight in God's way. This was in addition to the Fuqaha, to the Fuqaha's uh, flagrant attempt to totally eradicate the original meanings, for example, when they invented completely new fiqh terminology, such as the notion of, of an offensive jihad that, that had increasingly conditioned our understanding of the term, original terms such as innovations, enforced to eliminate the book's authentic meaning, have often been legitimized by references to the existence of a, sense, uh, a consensus, al ijma among scholars a consensus a consensus among scholars as if that would mean anything 
Not that it is wrong to achieve a consensus on matters of the book and to come to an agreement on how to apply it during a specific period of time and in a specific type of society, but it is fundamentally wrong to take an ijma that was achieved by a circle of scholars in one of the early centuries of Islam and propound it as a source of legislation, bringing it bring, binding for all future generations of Muslims eternally valid until the last hour. Such eternal validity of ijma gives human beings an example, scholars of the 9th to 10th centuries and immortality that strictly can only be attributed to God. Such eternal validity, uh, validity of ijma gives human beings an example scholars of the 9th and 10th centuries and immor immortality that strictly can only be attributed to god it ignores the simple fact that human societies that human societies constantly progress and that conditions of life always change it ignores the fact that new developments will uh, inevitably uh, overturn old consensus and that new parties, groups, and movements will emerge that question all uh, certainties and undermine the agreement of the past. This is not mentioned, this is not to mention the romanticist, uh, utopian bias in the scholar's conception of Ijma, because such a comprehensive sen uh, consensus is notoriously difficult to achieve. Societies possesses complex structure of human organization whose complexities cannot possibly be reduced or eliminated except by despotic authoritarian force even society open societies have pluralistic uh, uh, heterogeneous and multifarious structures producing myriads of different views and opinions that make it impossible to achieve a, com uh, a, communu a communal consensus what the notion of ijma disgu discusses disguises is the historical truth that the consensus of of the ummah has never amounted to more than the agreement of a few privileged scholars who dared their own views as sacrosanct while dismissing divergent views as heretical it also ignored ignores the possibility that even an absolute consensus can still be wrong the fact that in Israel there used to be a national consensus to occupy the territory of Palestine did not make the occupation right or uh, sacrosanct. And the beginning of an eternal opposition in Israel to the occupation proves, uh, proves that one time overwhelming majority are only temporary and can never be eternally maintained. We must relinquish this romanticist and utopian notion of ijma by acknowledging the historical truth that legislative decisions have always been made by an intellectual elite, whether they represent a majority or a minority, and that it can never attain immortality or infallibility. What might be right and good for one specific historical situation could be disastrous in another, and what has been harmful and regressive in an earlier period might be fruitful and beneficial in a later one, which is best illustrated by the example of the Mu'tazala. The act of fighting is, as Bakara 2.16 says, an obligation that is part of the human disposition, even though it is naturally disliked by everyone, this instinctive aversion to fight is imprinted maktub into human nature perhaps similar to the monthly cycle of women as as we hear about it in the prophetical hadith or the survival instinct of human beings who come to the to the fore to the fore regardless of how we feel about it the phrase and you dislike it means that fighting is unnatural it means that humans must be for against their will to fight and use violence to kill their opponents nonetheless the phrase it is prescribed to you implies a religious obligation that every human being has to fulfill like the obligation to fast fasting is prescribed to you Baqarah 183 
all the obligation of answering like with like in response to murder the law of equality is prescribed to you in case of murder chapter 2 verse 178 and this in spite of the fact that human beings naturally show great aversion to such acts and would instinctively avoid them as much as they could the universal nature of fighting is prescribed to you contradicts the view that fighting was only an obligation for the prophet and his companions since fighting is a natural disposition in as much as the dislike of it it is generally applicable to everyone and indeed a dislike of fighting has been observed with people who live long before muhammad he muhammad said it is it not possible if you were commanded to fight that you will not fight Baqarah 246 a dislike for fighting will be part of our constitution until the last hour such universe universality does not square with the common view that fighting is only a so-called collective or representative duty uh, al-kifaya which is fulfilled by only a few people for the benefit of all the verse says it is prescribed to you lakum implying all of us because to you does not pertain to a specific group of people but rather includes everyone who lived who lived before or after the prophet if the duty to fight was only a collective duty as some fuqa have claimed we should then apply the same thinking to the preceding verse chapter 2 verse 215 that is a few people should pay charity for the benefit of all which would be rather absurd god made aversion to fight a natural disposition and that includes dislike for killing and carrying out any other destructive act destructive act and yet his revelation made it incumbent upon every human being to fight if they need to fight to need to fighting is ordained for you though you dislike it though you dislike it after having explained the conditions for such necessary fights the book issues several verses with the imperative fight calling people to action even though they dislike it there is no reason to assume that the command fight in arabic qatilu is only directed at a selected flu a few since the plural form of the verb qatilu suggests that it is addressed at all humankind in their deliberate effort to impose a military connota uh, connotation upon the text the fuqaha believe that fight addresses only a few that is the army of the islamic empire that fought wars on behalf on the behalf of the entire community but you ask yourself where are they now such interpretation of course say more about the historical medieval and pre-modern context of our scholars in which military castes cast days such such as the mamluks turks and janissaries held the upper hand and saw the military aggression justified by the fuqaha reading of the quran more than about the actual meaning of the verses in the book the aims and objectives of fighting is next the aims and objectives of fighting is next